So guys, today we have a project on our hands. Unfortunately, it's on my baby, my 2018 Audi RS3. Like most Audi RS3s, they are notorious for water pump failure. And unfortunately, it's my time to deal with that. Now, it's common on A3s and S3s, but it is a plastic water pump. You'd think they would have corrected that on a car worth twice the price. They did in the, fact, in the terms that they made it aluminum and not plastic, but they still leak. Mine at 29,000 miles, which is mind boggling. So today we're gonna have to put this $300 part in here. And if you come look a little closer, let me show you where the water pump is. Right there. As you can see, it's a pain in the butt. So I'm gonna show you walking through this cause it's not as hard as it might seem, but it is definitely above a beginner level. I'd say this is more on the moderate to almost an advanced level of fixing these cars, but I'll show you step-by-step -step how I do it. I'll show you how to do it. And then lastly, for those wondering why I didn't just bring this to Audi and get it done, not only did the Audi of Fort Myers quote me a thousand dollars for this part, which I got straight from the UK for 350. I'll put a link to it down in the uh, description below, but they charged, they wanted to charge charged me, I got a quote of $3,000 to install this. Three grand to install a $300 part. So with that being said, I'm gonna show you what $3,000 worth of labor looks like and you'll be the judge. Let me know down in the comments below, but let's dive right into it. So in regards to the parts you're gonna need, it's really, there's not that much. The first thing you're gonna need is the water pump itself, which you can find in the description. You're also going to need some coolant. I believe you can use G13 on this, but I removed that silica packet. So we're gonna be using G12 Evo as a replacement. You can mix G12 with G13 in older cars. You can't mix G13 with G12 in newer cars, just some Audi nonsense. And then, if you go on FCP Euro, you can buy all the bolts needed to replace the water pump. Now you might be asking, well, why do you need all new bolts? Why not just use the ones that are on the car? That's a great question. Well, Audi uses special bolts and a lot of other dealers, they use something called stretch bolts which means they're one-time use. Once you put them in, that's it. When you take them back out, you have to replace them with new ones. So we'll be talking about the new bolts that we're gonna be replacing and also the list of all these bolts that you would need. You can buy, I think it was 20 bucks for all these. Is also on FCP Euro. I'll link it down in the description below. All right, and then the last step before we dive into the nitty gritty on uh, you know disassembling the engine bay, you wanna get the car on jack stands all around or put it on a lift. That'd be easier. You don't need to get it crazy high, but you need to get it high enough where you can access the exhaust bracket because we have to loosen that because we're going to be doing a lot of movement of the engine to get room. And you can't do that with the drive shaft in the way and with the exhaust locked and fixed. So we have to do that. So remember, get them all around, lift the car up, not too high, it's totally fine. You could, but this is how you want it. So unfortunately with the Audi RS3 and even, you know, Golfs and the a3s basically all those cars the type of water pump they use fails and you can kind of figure that out by either smelling a sweet smell in the engine bay seeing drips under the car but typically you have a catch pan or you have a belly tray which catches all the coolant so you'll never actually see the drips what you'll notice is you'll either get a low coolant light if you never open the engine bay or you'll see the line here drop. Now I've had to fill this up two or three times faster recently than before and that's how I knew it's time. And also if we look real deep in there, you'll actually be able to see a little bit of coolant not where it's supposed to be and you'll get a clearer picture of that in a little bit. If you take a peek right down there before I disassembled, you can see dried pink and also some wet stuff and that is a sign of coolant leaking there's also some more coolant down there. It's gonna be super hard to see, but you can see it. Yeah, right down there, those wet spots. All right, so the first step is we need to drain the coolant out of the reservoir. We don't need to do the whole car, but just as much from the reservoir as possible as we're gonna be moving this around. And I bought a Harbor Freight kit for like $8, and this is a pretty cool water pump or just transfer pump. So yeah, we're gonna do that right now. Obviously any method or pump will work, but the goal here is to just drain as much of the coolant out of the overflow reservoir as possible. Now, once that's done, I highly recommend also disconnecting the battery just as a safety precaution. Alrighty, now the next step is going to be removing the engine motor mount, the passenger side engine motor mount. And in order to do that, 
As you can see, there's a lot in the way here. So we're gonna disassemble all of this and I'll show you how in order to get that free. Now, in order to remove the passenger motor mount, we first need to clear some room. In order to do this, I needed to unclip the coolant overflow reservoir from its spot, as well as remove one screw, which frees up a bracket that holds the coolant lines in place. Super quick before we get any deeper into the project, uh, I just wanna show you how I'm keeping track of all these bolts because there will be a lot. Go get yourself a piece of cardboard, cut a hole. I'm gonna block my face so you can see. Cut a hole, shove the bolts through and mark what it is and keep going down and you'll know the order of how you took everything apart. So when you're time to put things back in, you go up and you keep repeating the process. Lastly, there's a small nut also that holds another bracket, which is ironically located on the top of one of the motor mount bolts. Now, before we remove the engine mount, we need to brace the engine underneath. And in order to do that, we need to remove the belly pan and then we're gonna use a jack with some wood to keep the engine in place. Going around the belly pan, you'll find about eight or so T12 bolts that hold it onto the car. Then all the way in the back, there are three large bolts that I believe are like 13 millimeter. Once the pan is out of the way, I use a jack with some wood so that I don't damage the bottom of the engine. Now I found a nice spot on the bottom of the oil pan and I jacked the engine up about half an inch, just enough to relieve some tension on the motor mount and motor mount bolts. Lucky for me, I was able to get my hands on the all data service diagrams, which will make finding the bolts and removing the water pump that much easier. Moving the reservoir out of the way, I could access the top bolt of the motor mount as well as the front and back bolts which all connect the motor mount to the frame of the car. All right, so with your three engine mount bolts removed, one, two, and three, you should be able to have some play now within your motor mount. If you don't have play, literally jack the engine up a hair ever so tiny, just a tiny bit of mount so that you have room to be doing that. Alrighty guys, so I've been trying to figure out how to actually get this motor mount out. I mean, it looks pretty simple. You got two bolts right here. You gotta get to one and two. And you think, oh, it's pretty easy to do. Well. Check that one out. All the way, way down yonder in the corner there, you can see bottom left of my screen. That's the other bolt you gotta get to. And guess what? There's no room to get to that. There's literally no room. And I'm like, there's no way you gotta be pulling this engine out. They gotta make it so that you can work on it. I just realized by watching some other YouTube YouTubers, you have to take the wheel off and then they put a hole through the frame rail where you can actually unscrew that bolt. So that's what we're gonna do now. So if you pull this back, there's one T12, pull it back. They made this nice little convenient hole. <laughs> what a lifesaver, let me tell you. It's right there. So that's funny, convenient. Uh, now we gotta get that out. It's a uh, 16 millimeter. Oh, there goes my light. Very useful tool. Extremely useful tool. But that was way easier than the other video I was watching. Holy cow. All right, cool. All that's left now are two more bolts which hold the mount into the engine. They're easily accessible with a wrench, but just make sure to loosen them both first before you unscrew them. Otherwise the motor mount will move around on you. Yeah, right? Loki's no point, but yeah. 
I ain't doing anything crazy, but motor mount is out. All right, so now that we got the passenger side motor mount off the car, the next step we're gonna do is remove the transmission motor mount. Um, and it's only two bolts. We're not actually taking uh, the dog bone mount out. We're just loosening two screws. And now because I'm doing that, I just wanna brace this side of the car too. And then we're gonna take the driver's side motor mount off and the car will be freely able to, to move around. But we're gonna jack this side up just to get some support. And then we'll get the, uh, the dog bone mount. And then actually we have to get the exhaust bolts off so that the downpipe can move with the engine. All right, the small bolt goes in the front. The big bolt goes in the middle. And now we have a loose mount so we can start moving this engine around. I know I'm jumping around all over the place, but after we got out the subframe motor mount bolts here, I'm, while I'm down here, well, A, you can see all the lovely coolant leaking here but we also want to disconnect this air hose because they're going to be shifting and moving the engine around. We don't want anything holding it. So I'm just going to unscrew it right here and pull this off. And then we'll start working on the down pipe down there. So for those who are trying to do this themselves, here's the instructions from all data. As you can see, we disconnected the dog bone mount and next is the air hose. After that, I have the down pipe bracket to disconnect and then lastly, I have to unscrew the transmission mount from the transmission itself. Simply using a flathead screwdriver, I loosened the hose clamp and pulled it off. Then I unscrewed the two bolts that hold the downpipe bracket to the car itself. This is so when we move the engine and shift the engine around, there won't be any resistance or extra pressure applied to wherever the engine is still connected to the frame of the car. Now, in order for me to access the transmission mount, I have to remove my aftermarket carbon fiber intake. This gave me enough room to access the plastic plate that sits on top of the transmission mount. It's held on with two small screws, which once off reveals the three large bolts that hold the transmission mount onto the transmission itself. With all of these removed, we can finally push the engine over and give us the much needed room to remove the water pump from the car. All right, so update for you guys. As you saw, everything is pretty much undone. The last step we're on is getting the belt, or sorry, is getting the serpentine belt off the water pump. Luckily, it's not a stretch belt, it's tensioner pulley. So we can, we need to find the pulley, which I think we found, move it and pull the belt off. I'm gonna leave it kind of in a rough position where it is, cause that's a pain in the ass to put back. And then we're gonna have to meddle with the engine a little bit, moving it around so we can get access to the bolts that are in the actual uh, water pump. We're looking, you can see all the coolant leaking right there. You can see all, that and then right here this should be the belt tensioner and this is the wherever it is i can't see this is the the nut we have to turn and it'll release tension all right so i have a i think it's a 15 don't take my word on that 15 mil we're gonna turn this to the right this way and it's gonna relieve tension sean is gonna be right here and he's just going to pull this off the water pump and he's going to hold it so we can figure out how to move it because we don't want to like fully take the belt off okay, okay. is it off it's e off. yep so hold it okay got I'm it gonna let tension back. okay all right so belt is off but i think just so we don't forget like the direction i'll like Put it up over here or something. Do I see the tension? All right, so we're at a point now, this is pretty much like the final step. This is the halfway point, if not three quarters, because reassembly should be pretty simple. I just want to show you the new water pump. The, what we're dealing with now is if we spin this, look at the three screws, it frees up. And that is a T30 that fits right in there. We need to unscrew these. Let me show you the problem. There ain't no room in there because it hits this. So I am fortunate enough, and I'll be, as you've seen, been sharing the instructions. It now says in order to remove that, we have to 
push the engine transmission assembly slide to the left, slightly to the left. Obviously, we need to free up space on this side, so we're pushing it that way to the, it'd be our right or this left. Now it's saying lift the engine with the right spindle. So because we don't have an engine hoist on the top mount, we have jacks. Theoretically, what it says we have to do now is jack this up just a hair enough to free us to get those three bolts out, and then we should be able to slide the pump out. Uh, wish us luck, we'll, we'll update you in a bit. All right. Update. Because a lot of people might think these things go smooth when you watch these videos, and I will be the first one to tell you that does not always happen. And I'm like shaking from the adrenaline rush I had now. So. Granted, you know, we're filming this, so it takes a while to change a water pump. It takes twice as long because I have to constantly change the batteries, check the angles, talk to you guys like this. Well, today's day two of me doing this and I should have it finished now, but the problem was I could not get the bottom bolt out and I'll show you that in a minute. And the reason was because my Torx was too long. I was using... The only T30 that I have is a 3 8 which does not fit with that ratchet. So I've been going mad trying to figure out how to change it. Um, I bought, I went to, you know, I had, I actually went to Walmart and I also went to uh, Home Depot to get a bunch of different stuff. I couldn't figure it out. So let me show you what it is that I got and what it is and how I got it out. I started this this morning at 8.15. Granted, I had to drive to Home Depot twice, but it's now 11.30, so eight, nine, 10, three hours fidgeting with this last bolt. And I'll show you what I mean in a second. All right, so I have this little kit I picked up from Walmart. I've had this for years and I've been using the ratchet, but there was no way to secure a T30 in this. It was too shallow. So I went yesterday and I got a, uh, a newer Hyper Tough kit, the 40 piece ratchet bit set. And this is perfect. This was extremely useful because this is a lifesaver. Because if you put this bit in like one of these, like this, like that, it'll fall out. There's nothing holding it. But the kit comes with, unlike this kit, this one comes with a way where you put it in and it holds it, which is incredible. And this is just enough room to get in. Now the problem is, I bought two different styles of this. You can see here. I have a two inch Milwaukee, which is great. And I have this right here, which is the smaller one. It's about a one inch. You can see the difference. Maybe one and a half with this one. Problem was this bottom bolt, there is like no room to get this bottom one right there. So what I had to do, every time I would use the two inch, I couldn't get it in perfectly. It's so difficult to see. I had to use my phone as a camera as like a scope to see this get in. The problem is the engine is tilted. You actually have to tilt it quite a bit. Check this out, if this focuses. The engine is almost like, the max you can lift this side is maybe two and a half to three inches max. This side you can drop about, I'd say you can see how low I've dropped it. I've dropped it about three and a half inches. And if you look under the car, you can see the sides lower than that side. The problem is, Every time I'd stick this in, I, you know, it's hard because you can't go straight because the engine's crooked. So you have to kind of angle it up. Well, there was too much, you know, you move this a tiny bit up and you're throwing it off like 20 degrees on the bottom. So this is too big. So this one finally, and this is the key here. This is literally all you will need to solve this problem. You need this key, this one, it's just short enough where there's not really much play and you have to lightly like tap it, tap it, tap it. I also used a crap ton of WD-40 on that bottom bolt, which is right here. How does one spray that? You get one of these and you can adjust it. Very useful here. But this, this is the lifesaver. This right here, this kit saved my life. And I was gonna go to Harbor Freight I was like, let me try Walmart. And this, this thing is a, it's, 
Uh, unbelievable, unbelievable. For reference, I wanna show you how low it is in there. You have to jack the car up, jack the engine up on this side and down on the other. And you can see if we shift this over, wherever it might be, let me go lower, sorry, right there. That's the bolt. And you got that much room before you hit the frame of the car. That's the bolt. With the three screws removed, we can finally inspect the old water pump and see what actually failed. Fortunately for anyone trying to replace their own water pump, the three bolts are held in with rubber grommets. So when you loosen the screws, you don't actually have to take them out of the assembly. You just need to unscrew them enough so that they are no longer in or connected to the engine. Next, you need to remove the hose that's connected to the top of the water pump, and then you can very lightly start to pull the pump out. I covered the inside area with a plastic tarp to prevent the coolant from getting all over the belts and pulleys, which I recommend doing because once you pull the pump out, you're gonna lose about two and a half quarts of coolant and really quickly too. Oh, oh there it is. Ah! ah, look at that. What? Did you pull it out yet? Also, when it comes time to pull out the pump, if there's still not enough room, try pushing the engine forward just a little bit while also pulling the pump out and it should clear the frame rail. All right, so for those wondering where this actually failed from, you can see it's this bump right here. I can zoom in, you can see where the coolant has been dripping right here, straight down from in there. So it actually failed inside here than the seal itself, which is pretty weird. Finally, we are at the halfway point and can start to put everything back together. Make sure to clean and wipe off the mating surface of the engine as that's where the water pump inner gasket will seal. If you don't clean it, you could run the risk of it leaking again. Next, make sure to tighten the three water pump bolts to nine newton meters or six and a half foot pounds. And lastly, I installed the rubber hose back on and had Sean help me put the serpentine belt on as well. Alrighty guys, so finally, after struggling quite a bit, the new water pump has been installed into the car and we have the serpentine belt back on. It's good to have a partner doing that because if you just slap it right off, you don't have to take the entire thing off the car. I actually don't even recommend it, just push it to the side. Now, the next step we're doing, as you just saw, we lined everything up, put the engine back to being straight, and a tip. Remember this from the beginning? This is how we're going to put everything back together in the order, starting from the bottom, put the bolts back in the transmission, and we're gonna go up. However, I wanna put the transmission, dog bone, and passenger motor mounts, all the, the bolts in, to, uh, like hand tight, and then we're gonna torque them down to spec, just to make sure that the engine is sitting exactly where it needs to be, and then we'll tighten it. Now also, how you can tell how low the car needs to go, literally just pull this out, from right here and check it out. Just line it up once you get that bolt straight through, that hole straight through, you're good. And then I guess you can use this too as a reference. Just look through these, one, two, three. And obviously we can just move the engine around however we want to align it all. Remember, when you're doing the transmission, dog bone, passenger motor mount, and a few others, you have all new hardware you need to reinstall or install. Don't use these, these are Use your shot, throw them out, or save them for something else. But don't put them back on the car, use new hardware. So doing everything in reverse order, Sean and I push the engine over and roughly back into the correct spot. Then I very slowly raise the driver's side of the engine up high enough so that the holes roughly aligned with the transmission mount. After I drop the passenger side down just enough so that the bolt hole lined up in the passenger wheel well. With everything looking good, it was time to put the motor mount back into the engine bay and loosely install all the bolts back into the mounts. It's 
extremely important to remember to hand thread all the bolts first as to not cross thread anything because that would not be good. Now, there's no real order to installing the bolts. Just make sure to use brand new hardware and not to tighten them down yet. Also, don't forget to reinstall the air hose on the bottom of the engine. So for those that are following along trying to do this themselves, feel free to pause the video here and take a picture of all the bolt torque specs that I have on all data. This is what I reference to tighten everything down. Remember, this is in Newton meters and not foot pounds. So make sure to convert it if you need to, and then also turn it 90 degrees. Next up was to tighten down the downpipe exhaust bracket, and these don't need to be torqued to any specific spec. Now, once everything is installed correctly, you can take the jacks off the engine and start reassembling the engine bay. Put the plastic transmission mount cover back on and reinstall your intake. All that's left now is to reattach the coolant reservoir and screw the two brackets back into place and fill the car with coolant. Alrighty guys, so that is it for placing a water pump on a 2018 Audi RS3. I believe you could also do this on the facelift TT RS versions. I think the pre-facelift versions of the RS3 and TT RS have a slightly different alteration to the water pump, but the steps are fairly similar. Um, you know, things just might be, you know, in different places. Otherwise, the last step in finishing the water pump replacement is actually bleeding the coolant system because you lose a lot of coolant when you take that off. Now, in order to do that, you can see uh, we've went through about, I'd say almost three quarts of coolant putting this in. Now, obviously you can't put it all in in one shot. What you actually have to do is start the car, run it to temperature, and then turn your heat and the fans all the way up to max so that this way the thermostat can turn on and the system can bleed itself of the air or burp itself of the air. Drive it around a little bit, you know, closely just to check on it, keep topping it off. That's pretty much what I did. I took it for one or two very baby laps, watched the coolant go down. You can fill it up probably even higher, all the way up to here if you check this out. You can fill it up probably a bit higher than the min line or the max. You can fill it up probably to here. And then, you know, the first time you start the car, that'll drop down. You probably won't be feeling any heat at idle when you first turn the car on with the heat up. And that means that there is air in the system. So you're gonna have to drive it around, top it off, check it again. And I did this maybe three times. In the third attempt, I really gave it some power. I got the engine up to about 205 degrees Fahrenheit. And that was enough uh, where all the coolant was down. And just use this as a measurement. You're gonna need about maybe a little less than three quarts of coolant to fill it back up, but just keep that in mind. And otherwise that's it. If you like this content, then definitely make sure to smash the like button, turn on post notifications, subscribe. If you have any questions, let me know down in the comment section below. I'll see you in the next video. Lovely. Closer